What do we do when we see bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? How do we respond to God when he doesn't work like we think he should? Are we wrong? Is he wrong? Is there really such a thing as wrong? I believe the answer is a whole lot bigger than our question. We are in the book of Habakkuk again for a second week, looking at three big God questions everybody has and why it's not a bad thing. Briefly, I just want to briefly, briefly review. We were in chapter 1 last week because the review is important because last week's message plays a part in this morning's message because Habakkuk has a second question. And that second question is directly related to the question he asked last week. You may remember that the question we saw, the first question was in verse 2. As Habakkuk is looking out at the nation, there is unrighteousness, there is all kinds of sin prevailing, and justice is winning. And and, And Habakkuk cries out, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear or cry to you violence, and you will not save. He's asking God, God, do you care? That was the core question that we realized that Nehemiah or Habakkuk was asking. God, do you care that there's unrighteousness taking place and you're not doing anything about it? God, do you care that your name is being profaned? Do you care that there's violence everywhere? Do you care that there's no judgment? You see, the core question was about care. Very similar to the question that the disciples asked in Mark 4 when they were in the boat in the middle of the storm and Jesus was asleep in the boat and they wake him up and they say, Master, do you not care that we're perishing? You see, Habakkuk asked that question because he believed God cared. Do you remember me saying last week that the reason why these big God questions are not a bad thing is because they reveal at least three things about us. When we're able to ask God the big God questions like, God, do you care? We realize first that it reveals care, concern, or interest on our part. It reveals care, concern, or interest on our part. God, I care about this. I care about what's going on. I care about what I'm experiencing. I care about my relationship with you. Our questions reveal care, concern, or interest. Secondly, our questions reveal a quest for truth or answers. I'm telling God, God, I don't understand, I don't know, so I'm seeking the truth, I'm seeking the answers by pursuing you, by asking you. And third, and probably the most uh, profound to me about what they reveal, is that they reveal presuppositions we all have about God. That when I ask God, God, do you care? I'm asking that question because I presuppose in my mind that God cares. Even if you are an un- or were an unbeliever and you ask that question, God, if you're there, do you care? You're asking that question because at some point you have this presupposition in your mind that there is this, this eternal being or there is this divine being that cares, or at least that's what you believe. So our questions reveal our care, concern, or interest. They reveal a quest for truth or answers, and they reveal presuppositions we have about God. Now, this question this morning, I want to tell you this. I think it's important. This question this morning is the second question of three that I believe every person has at some point in their life. And this question we're going to deal with this morning, I believe, is part of a downward progression if we don't get the first question answered sufficiently. If I ask God that first question, God, do you care? And I don't walk away with an answer that I feel is satisfactory. I'm going to slip down to this second question. It's a downward progression. God tells Habakkuk, yes, Habakkuk, I'm bringing, I'm raising up the Babylonians to come. And they're going to be an instrument of discipline on my people, these wicked people that you've talked about. And here's Habakkuk's response, chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 2, verse 4. Habakkuk says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. 
O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, the Babylonians, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? If you're taking notes, verse 13 is question number two. Let me read it one more time. You who are of pure eyes and to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. What's Habakkuk asking? God says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. The Babylonians are going to come and be an instrument of discipline on my people because of their unrighteousness. The question in verse 13 is not the real question, not the core question. The core question that Habakkuk is asking is not, when, why do you look idly at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? The question that Habakkuk is asking is this one. Are you fair? God, it doesn't make sense. What Habakkuk is saying is, God, you know how wicked those Chaldeans are. You've outlined for us already, he says, how wicked these Chaldeans are. You don't, they don't care about you, they don't care about God, they don't care about people, they don't care about mercy, they don't care about anything. All they care about is like, like, like beasts just running into a nation and tearing it down and stripping it clean. That's all they care about. And in Habakkuk's mind, he couldn't justify how this holy God who he comes to this place with this presupposition that God is just, in his mind, this seemed absolutely unjust. God, how could you allow your people, as imperfect as they are, your covenant people, to be ransacked by them? Now, you and I probably have never asked that question on a national level. May never had a reason to. But we've probably asked that question on a smaller scale. God, I've worked hard to raise my children in a way that honors you, and in a way that, 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 that sets out the path before them. And then, now, God, they're not walking with you. God, they're, 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 they're turning from you. God, I did my best to, to, to model Christ and, and to, to implement them into the family of God, and now they don't care anything about you. And I've got friends, God, that haven't cared at all about their children's spiritual life, and they're living for the Lord. God, where's the fairness there? You may say, God, wait a second, how come he left me for her and his life is great and my life's junk right now? Where's the fairness there? You may say, God, I don't understand why I worked my tail off and was faithful for the company and that guy that lies, cheats, and swindles gets the promotion instead of me. Where's the fairness in that, God? God, I've done all I can do to the best of my ability to live for you, and yet I get that diagnosis, and it looks like my life's going to be cut short, while people that don't care about you, God, they're living into their 90s, and they've got great lives, and they're prosperous. Where's the fairness? We've probably 
had that thought enter our mind at times when we're looking at the apparent injustice, the apparent silence of God in the midst of abounding wickedness, and we say, God, I don't understand. This doesn't level up for me. If I don't get the question, do you care, answered satisfactorily, the next step down is, God, are you fair? The first question dealt with the relational component of God. It's what we would ask of our dad, our spouse. Do you care? Because that's a relational question. You're not going to ask your dad or your spouse necessarily, are you fair? That's a question that's reserved for the judge. Here, he's now moving further. God, I, I, I know you said, I know you, you say you care, but this doesn't look fair. So now instead of dealing with the heart of God, he's dealing with the character and the nature of God. And I'm telling you, if you don't get that question answered, you go down to the third. It's a downward progression. Three questions I believe everybody has about God. Do you care? Are you fair? And the one at the bottom next week. What do we do when we feel that God is not fair? My purpose this morning is not just to show us the whole Remind us if we're in a hole, but hopefully be able to find in Scripture steps for being able to get out of the hole and restore our relationship with God. Number one, here's what Habakkuk did. Chapter 2, verse 1, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Number one, when I feel like God's unfair, I want to position myself in such a way as to hear from God. I want to position myself in such a way as to hear the answer from God. That's what Habakkuk is doing. In fact, if you think about it, Habakkuk is being obedient in the last thing he heard God say to him. You remember in chapter 1, verse 5? Habakkuk says, God, how long are you going to make me look and see all this unrighteousness? Remember what God said? Use the same Hebrew words to say, Habakkuk, go look and see out among the nations. Watch, Habakkuk, because I'm doing something in your life that you wouldn't even believe if somebody told you. Habakkuk is doing the exact thing that God told him to do, to get out and to look out among the nations. Now let me, warn, let me tell you this. This next thing I'm about to say is based off of a description in God's Word, not a prescription from God's Word. When I tell you that he gets out and he goes to the watchtower to see what God is going to say, he's positioning himself to hear from God. And I think part of that, one of the important things there, is he kind of gets away from the noise. He withdraws away from other things and focuses, puts himself in a position to focus. I'm not saying necessarily that you need to withdraw from people. I am saying that we often have to put ourselves in a position to cut through all the noise, all of the distractions, so we can hear clearly from God. Now, make no mistake, I'm not suggesting that we climb up onto a mountain and sit silent, hoping that God will speak to us in an audible voice, because we have something better. God is not silent on the issues of our culture. God is not silent on the issues of our hurts. And God is most definitely not silent on the issues of his character, which is what Habakkuk is asking. God is very clear on the issues of our culture, on the issues of our questions, and on the issue of his character in his word. And I believe that if we're going to ask big God questions, we need to go to the big God answers, which are found in God's word. We need to be able to put ourselves in a position to say, I believe the answer is in here, God, and I want to look for it. Now, some of you may say, Pastor, that would be like, handing me a set of encyclopedias and telling me to look something up and to get an answer. Some of you may look at this and think of all those pages and how exhausting it could be. For some of you, it may not be getting away from everybody. For some of you, it may be finding somebody, finding another believer, finding a group, a family group, a small group, maybe just an accountability group, somebody in the church 
Maybe a pastor, a staff member to come alongside and say, hey, I'm really struggling here and I want help. I believe there's an answer and I want to be able to find this answer in Scripture. Now I want to warn you, even though there's an answer, that answer may not be to your satisfaction, but it's an answer nonetheless. It may not be an answer that we can fully comprehend down here. We'll get some more of that later. What did he do? The first thing we need to do is to position ourselves to hear or to find the answer from God, most specifically in God's Word. Number two, we find the answer in verse two and three. Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. Number two, when I feel like God is being unjust, unjust, I want to trust God's timing. Here's what God tells Habakkuk. Habakkuk, I told you it's coming in your lifetime. It's going to be amazing. It's going to hurt. (laughs) And immediately he tells Habakkuk this. Habakkuk, I'm not going to be late. You see, we get too focused on man's calendars rather than God's Word oftentimes. And you see, as I mentioned last week, God is not bound by time because He is the creator of time. And because He is the creator of time, He is unbound and works outside of it. He's aware of it, He uses it, He instituted it, but He is not bound by it. And there's so much more going on on the element of time than you and I have any any way to be able to see. We cannot possibly see, understand, or comprehend all that God is doing in the midst of our situations. This week, our family groups, almost half of our church is going to gather together in homes and and in other locations, and they're going to be talking about two things this week, part of the sermon this morning. But one of them is this. They're going to look in John chapter 11, and they're going to be able to discuss What are some of the things, what were some of the purposes that God had, Jesus had, in delaying His his going to, to Lazarus? See, what happened in John 11 was Jesus got word that Lazarus, his friend, was sick, and Jesus delayed His coming. Jesus didn't go immediately. He waited for, for several days before He left. Why? When He shows up, Lazarus is dead. The Bible tells us in John 11 gives us three reasons. I won't go into those reasons for you this morning. That's for the family group this week. But what I will tell you is this. God did have a purpose. Jesus had a purpose. He gave us three reasons why He delayed His coming and, and, and Lazarus died. In 2 Peter chapter 3, which is going to be the next book we're going to be reading after this series is over. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says this. There's a reason why God has delayed the coming of Jesus. There's a reason. There's always a reason. And I have to settle that in my own heart. That even though it looks like God is being unjust, even though it looks like God is delaying, I have to remember He holds all time in His hands. And there's more at work that I don't see. Isn't it funny how God's long-suffering is both a problem and praiseworthy in our life? It's a problem when we believe God is not acting quick enough to judge other people. But it's praiseworthy when He has been patient with us. Right? Isn't that how it works? Oh God, You are gracious to me. But God, don't be as gracious to them. Smite them, oh smiter. That's what we want. I just went, King James, smiteth. There's a scripture going to be on the screen. I want to show you something that blows me away. When I'm reminded that things seem to be, God seems to be late. When I'm reminded that things hurt and I wonder, God, are you fair? The story, this verse comes to my mind. The scripture is going to be on the screen for you. It's Genesis 15, 13 through 16. Hear this one really well. This is God's covenant with Abraham he's making. Listen to what he says. And the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. What God just told Abraham 
is your descendants are going to be carried off into a nation that's not theirs. We know that to be the slavery of God's people in Egypt. In the brick pits. 400 years. Horrible. Crying for a deliverer for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. What's God saying? They may have had their wages stolen as slaves in Egypt, but when they come out, they're going to get a plus interest. They're going to take all of Egypt's possessions and have it as their own when they leave after 400 years. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. Listen to this carefully. They shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Come back here. That place that God is saying is here is the land of promise. The land that he promised to give to his people, a land flowing of milk and honey. What God just told them is, I'm going to take your descendants into a nation that's not theirs. They're going to be afflicted for 400 years. I'm going to bring them out with great possessions, and then I'm going to bring them to the land. And you know why I'm not bringing them to the land right now, Abraham? Do you know why, Abraham, I'm delaying them coming into the promised land now? Is because the iniquity of the Amorites, the people who possess the land currently, has not risen to the level that I can justify kicking them out. That's incredible. So when I start thinking, God, you're late. When I start thinking, God, you're unfair in this. I don't understand this. This seems unjust. I have to remember this. That God was willing to hear the cries of desperation of his people in the brick pit for 400 years because the sin of the people who lived in the promised land had not risen to the level that God could justify getting them out. That's incredible to me. So when I see this, I see that God is not unfair. The same God that allowed His nation to suffer in the womb of Egypt was actually extending grace. 400 years of grace to a wicked people. He wouldn't even kick them out until He had justifiably Righteous to do so. I can't see everything. I don't understand everything. It looks unjust. It looks unrighteous. But no, it's not. But the pain on my side may be a relief for somebody on the other side. God's hand that's heavy on me here may actually be a relief for somebody else. No, and I have to admit that. Number three, we don't just trust God's timing, we trust God's vision. He sees everything. He sees it perfectly. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 6 through 20, God pronounces the woes on Babylon. I won't read the entire scripture to you, but I want you to see in verse 6, there's a woe of the one who steals. This nation has robbed other nations that they've conquered. In verse 9, there's a a particular woe pronounced on them because they are evil but feel secure. They're evil, they know it, but they don't feel like any harm is going to come to them. Verse 12, there's a woe pronounced on them because they are violent but prosperous. They've gotten all this stuff by wicked means. They're evil. They've taken it from them. But you know what? They're prosperous. They don't care. Verse 15, there's a woe pronounced on them because they seduce others. Tempt them. And verse 19, there is a woe pronounced on them because they are idolaters. Consider those woes. They steal. They're evil but feel secure. They're violent but prosperous. They seduce others. They are idolaters. You know what God's saying? Habakkuk, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I know who they are. You're right, Habakkuk, they are wicked. What God is saying is, woe on them, it's coming. The judgment is coming. Two things those woes tell me. And the two things that it tells me cause me to sit up a little straighter. Of those two things, one of them, if you notice those woes, is that God is saying that His apparent silence 
or inaction does not equal his approval. Think about this for a moment. He's telling Habakkuk, just because they're coming, just because I'm silent right now, just because it seems like I'm not doing anything does not mean I approve of it. In our life, believers, we should never mistake God's apparent silence or inaction in our life as approval for sin. If I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing, going places I shouldn't be going, saying things I shouldn't be saying, looking at things I shouldn't be looking at, and saying in my heart, God hasn't done anything about it. He hasn't stopped me. He hasn't brought in Nathan the prophet to point his bony finger at me and tell me thou art the man. He hasn't done that. Then he must approve. It's a very, very dangerous place to be. I also learned that prosperity and advantages do not always equal favor. Though I would love to launch into a tirade, undressing the prosperity gospel this morning, For the sake of time, I do not have the ability to do so. But I will tell you that prosperity and advantages do not always equal God's favor. We learn from the woes pronounced here. If you're taking notes, the parable of the rich fool, Luke chapter 12. The story of the rich man and Lazarus, Luke chapter 16, both tell us they serve as a cautionary tale that prosperity does not equal favor and approval. Number four, final point. Verse four, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. For those of you that have memorized this verse in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, three times in the New Testament, this little verse is used, the just shall live by faith. You know what God's telling Habakkuk? you got all this wickedness around you, Habakkuk. you got more wickedness that's coming in to overpower the wickedness that's here. Don't be wicked, Habakkuk. Focus on your life of godliness and your walk of faith. You keep yourself pure. Don't allow yourself to be disgruntled, to be discouraged. Don't allow yourself to be carried off in in the actions that they are doing around you. Habakkuk, you remain faithful. Watch yourself. It's funny that this morning we talk about fairness. We look and we say, God, you're you're not, doesn't seem like you're being fair. While overlooking sometimes maybe one of the possibly biggest injustices ever. (laughs) That he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As another New Testament writer, the just for the unjust. If you and I want to talk about fairness, let's look at the cross, right? How... How do we react knowing that a God who never sinned, a man who never sinned, God in the flesh died in my place, who's become a professional sinner at times. And not only that, He didn't just die for me. He took my sins upon Him and He never sinned. He took my place. And He... He died to give me everything that was His? When I think of unfairness, the real, my eyes should be caught on Calvary. And don't get me wrong, God was not unjust. I'm not saying that God was unfair. Listen, it may seem unfair from our perspective, but He did it fairly. He fulfilled the requirements of the law and His holiness that we couldn't. So what do we do when things are unfair? We think things are unfair. Position yourself to hear from God. Trust His timing. Trust His vision. Focus on yourself. And let your eyes and your mind be caught away to Calvary.
the just for the unjust. Maybe this morning, that's where you're at. Maybe you are saying, God, it seems unfair. I hope you get this question answered today. God, are you fair? I hope within your heart to God, that answer is yes. I hope it's a resounding yes. Because the next question, if you don't get that answered, we got the third one. It's as low as it goes. I don't know what decision you have, but I'm going to invite you. I've got counselors, men and women that are ready to pray with you, to counsel you. You may not know exactly what that next step is. They'll help you. We will help you. I want to invite you to take that next step toward Jesus this morning. Father, this morning, we're thankful that we can ask you big God questions and that you're big enough to receive them. You never rebuke Habakkuk for asking the question. We thank you, Father, for that and pray this morning as we contemplate the things we have heard and seen, we pray that you help us flesh these out in our life. Let us go out, Lord. Let us be restored and healed this morning from these questions that we've wrestled with forever. Pray that you would bring hope and encouragement to us and to see that you have it all under control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.